Okay, so we're talking about private lending today. What is that mailbox money all about? People are talking about getting passive income month over month. We're live on Instagram, we're live on the Mike Rose Hart Show, which is my second YouTube channel where I go live every single Wednesday at 7 p.m. Today's a special episode. I've never done a triple stream before, all at once, so we're gonna have some fun with that. Private lending. So we're gonna talk today about what it's like being a private lender. So lending your money out getting a 10% rate of return, like a 10% Guaranteed, basically, rate of return. What are some of the things you need to think about as someone who's lending money out? I had a lot of questions on this recently. And what do you need in order to borrow money privately to buy real estate or buy businesses, etc.? What are some of those things that you need to be doing? Hey guys, over here. Good to see you all on. So we're talking about private lending. That's what's going over here to the Instagram as well. So I made some notes behind me in the whiteboard. You guys can't see them, but the four things I think that are the most important when it comes to deciding what you want to do with private lending as an investor. So say you're someone who has some money, you've got a whole equity line of credit, say you've refinanced your house and you've got access to say a couple hundred thousand dollars, you can borrow from the bank at you know prime plus a half or something like that. You've got money in your house, equity, or you've got cash sitting around, you've got investments that aren't performing the way you want. You're either just beginning on the journey, you either don't want to invest in the physical business or real estate yourself and do the hard work, because it's a lot of work, or you've made it. So I think when you're getting started, you don't have the expertise, so it makes sense to lend your money out so it isn't sitting there doing nothing. This gets your money working for you. Like a 10% rate of return, it's great monthly passive income you can use to offset your living expenses. It's a great option, I think, for first-time starters. Then there's like the person who's maybe a bit more experienced, but just tired of the landlord and dig, tired of dealing with all of the bull, right? And they're feeling like, hey, it'd be a lot better if I just got passive money every month. And then there's the guy who's thinking, I've made my money. Like, well, I need to eventually get to this point. When I get to like 10 or 20 million net worth, I can just take 20 million dollars, invest it in other people, private lending, lend it out to 10%, and get 200, two million dollars a year passive income. When you've got 10 or 20, 10, say 10 million dollar net worth, does it make sense to continue to grind, do all the work, and fight with the tenants? When you get a million dollars a year passive income, at a certain point, you say, hey, I'm done. It's not worth my time to manage the low value stuff. And so you gotta make that decision and kind of go from there. So what are the four things you should look for if you're looking to lend your money out? So the first thing I think you need to decide is the amount. How much do you wanna lend? What are you comfortable lending out? Maybe you've got $500,000 in a home equity line of credit or a HELOC, or you've got $200,000 in your RRSP that you could lend out. You can lend out, by the way, from registered accounts. You can lend out from your RRSP, private mortgages on properties. You can lend out through your tax-free savings account or TFSA private mortgages. You can also do it from unsecured with cash you've got. You can use borrowed funds from the bank from an unsecured line of credit or a whole equity line of credit. There's so many options, there's a plethora of options, but it's deciding the first thing is the amount. How much are you comfortable lending? I think that might depend on the project, but for each person it's a different amount. And maybe don't go all in. Maybe you've got $500,000, don't lend it all to one person. Or maybe you do. Maybe you decide like that's the relationship you want to cultivate. And you say, okay, I know this guy. I trust them. I'm going to lend them all my money. I'm the type of person who will probably pick like two or three people to be like my main guys. They're my active people that I lend to. I like to develop that relationship and monitor that relationship. So I know there's safety and diversity and spreading your loans out to many different people. A lot of crowdfunding type platforms you can lend to multiple people are great. Like Lending Tree in the United States is great for that. Um, but here in Canada, crowdfunding person-to-person -person lending isn't actually allowed right now. It's technically against the law. My friends at Lending Loop, uh, actually, they were in my class at Ivy, the uh, CTO and the CEO co-founders, uh, they started lending to, lend to businesses through their platform and take a cut. So we're going to talk about how that works, how you go through like professional private lenders and how they're like mortgage brokers that take fees to set you up with investment opportunities. You can lend your money through that way, or you can develop that relationship with people that you basically... Uh, meet through social media or you know various networking events and things like that. So the amount that you are going to need to to invest is really really important. You got to decide what you're working with. So if you've got like five hundred thousand dollars, you might be working a different type of project than if you've got five thousand dollars to lend that. Right. So the first thing is the amount. The timeline is really important too. So are you comfortable doing short term private money lending or do you want more longer term private money lending? What do I mean by short or long term? So short term private lending typically is like one. I'd say three to six months. And in less than three months, is still technically short-term lending. But most of the promissory notes that I see that are signed or most of the uh, private 
you know, seconds and thirds. A lot of them I'm seeing are on the shorter term side. Typically, like the second mortgages and the first mortgages are on longer terms, minimum a year. It has the legal costs to set them up, you know, to register a first mortgage on title. We'll get into talking about how we do that in a little bit here, right? Because I'm going to talk about unsecured lending, like secured lending against properties, et cetera, personal guarantees against net worth, et cetera. And I'm going to tell you about the 10 things you should look for when you're trying to pick the borrower. So stay tuned for all that stuff about coming up soon. So you get the amount that you need to decide that you're comfortable lending out. The amount you have lined out, you might have to refinance your house to decide, hey, I want to put that capital to better use. Sitting in my house as equity, you know, doing nothing for me. A lot of people in Toronto, Vancouver have that money sitting there. They have money in their RSPs, their TFSAs, or just in their house or in the rental properties doing nothing. And I talked about that last episode on the Mike Rosar show about how people are just wasting the capital that they have. And there's a cost of keeping capital tied up. And this Saturday's video coming out on my main channel is going to talk just right about all of the costs of actually homeownership and renting versus buying. So stay tuned for that video. It's going to be a really good one. I think it's going to pop off better than last Saturday's video, which is already at over 15,000 views on my side. Okay, so you've got, first you decide the amount, you decide the timeline you're comfortable with. You might say, hey, I'm okay with short-term lending, 90, 120 days. I want a 30-day recall period. I want a 60-day recall period term. You kind of decide from there what makes sense for you, right? Some people might find that it makes good sense for them to lend for just six months because maybe they want to buy a property in six months they've got that time horizon figured out. So figure out for yourself what time horizon makes sense for you. The next is the risk level. This is really important. We talk about risk and return. The four things are amount, timeline, how long you want to lend for it, the risk level you're comfortable with, and then the rate of return you expect for that risk level. Now, there, I can draw you an exact proportional chart. As risk increases, rate should increase. As risk decreases, rate should decrease. So how much should you get for private lending your money out? How much should you pay for borrowing private money? It depends is the answer on your risk level. What is the risk of the person that you're lending the money to? We're going to talk about the 10 ways to assess risk in a minute here. So stay tuned. So I'm going to get to that big list in, in a sec here. Um, just going to check the comments, make sure people are still chilling. Hey, Antonio, how are you doing? Mary, how are you doing? A lot of people jumping in. Good to see you guys all on. Chandler says, love the energy. Let's go. Right on. So it's really hot here, by the way, guys. We have like big lights on me right now. The overhead lights off, and I'm cooking in a dress shirt. So if you guys start seeing like sweat pouring out, or, like my cheeks getting a bit rosy, that is mostly because it's really hot in this room. Okay, Teddy Rock's gonna wash me at all three. That's that's sweet. Um, the future says, Mike, you inspired me to work 80 hours a week this summer just to see if I can do it. Got to build that work ethic. That's awesome, man. I love that. Love the hustle. I respect the hustle. And I think at the end of the day, if you hustle hard enough and you hustle smart, you're going to build wealth and you're going to become a better you than you would have been both, I think, mentally, emotionally, and financially. BitConnect. No, just no. Like everyone watches Graham Stephan's channel, just like you could, we'll table that. Uh, yeah, you can save a down payment while in college. I did exactly that by hustling and grinding. So it's totally possible to do that. Mike, good to see you on. Good to see all you guys on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching, I hope the nine just jumped on and voted for Trump. <laughs> um, jokes. So anyway, um, I don't even know what we titled this YouTube. I forgot to title it Private Lender. I don't think this micro start show is even titled Private Lender. Did we title I think I forgot to title it. Did we title it on any other platforms? Okay, someone hashtag private lending for me. Like just type in like in the comments, hashtag private lending, and maybe people will find that. So anyway, um, we'll rename it after so people can find it. I'll retitle the video. Anyway, four things. Amount, timeline, risk level, and then rate. So when I'm talking about risk level, I'm talking about what sort of projects are you comfortable investing in? And there are certain risks associated with those said projects. For instance, on the real estate side, you want to lend in real estate. There are many ways you can lend real estate projects and investors. So one way is funding land developments. Highly risky, in my opinion. One city councilor vote against you. One paid off guy in the back room that decides to squash a project or rezone it, and your ROI is terrible. So land developments are extremely risky, and yet hundreds of millions of dollars of Vancouver and Toronto capital flows right into it. So I don't know why a lot of people like to invest in land developments, like this massive balloon payment. We're gonna talk about how you get paid with private lending as well in a minute here, because there's several ways you can get paid, and not all of them are just a fixed rate of return. There are many different strategies I've seen in the private lending space. So we'll get to that in a sec. 
But land development is something extremely risky. I've never participated in investing in land development, but I have done private lending to flippers. I have done private lending to people in my network that I trust and to real estate investors that focus on cash flow. I think that if you're lending to on the real estate side, you need to evaluate the risk. You need to say, okay, what market am I investing in? Is it you know, a market that has a high cost to rent ratio? If you look at the data, it suggests that in times of recession, the places with the lowest cap rates are hit the hardest from a price perspective. Look at 2008 in the Great Recession. We studied this at Ivy. The East and the West Coast, the most highly coveted areas, right? The highest price and the lowest rent to price ratios were hit the hardest. They were destroyed. The nice places to live along the coasts. Midland, like right in the Midwest US, where house prices were fifty or seventy thousand dollars for a single family house, they rented for a thousand or twelve hundred dollars a month. Those properties were largely unaffected. Rents have never gone down in history on average. Rents tend to always increase over time. So if you're funding someone who's buying properties that cash flow well, that self-service your debt, there's a lower level of risk. If you're funding someone in the real estate side that has no cash flow, that's bought a property, that's not rented out, single family house, they're gonna flip and turn around. There's a lot of risk there, a lot of market risk there. Market risk is something you can't control. So if the market turns sour, what happens to your loan? If the properties drop 30% in value, what happens to your loan? If it's against a property in, say, London, Ontario, that was bought for cash flow purposes, or in the Midwest United States, or another smaller market that has a great price to rent ratio, you're okay because the borrower has strong cash flow. Rents continue to come in in a recession, and they can continue to service their debt payments to you. So the question to ask yourself is when you look at risk, how risky is the project? And I think risk stems back to ability to repay. So, how likely is it they're going to be able to repay you the money? and pay your interest. And so that comes to me from how many exit strategies do they have? Could they hold? In a land development that they can't finish, they have to hold 10 years, your ROI becomes negative real fast because of carrying costs. Flippers, the exact same thing. If they're flipping, they plan just to sell the property and that's it, there's no cash flow strategy. Like these are single family homes that are like $500,000 of rent for 2K a month. There's no cash flow there. In those types of projects, you're funding those as a private lender, you're taking a higher risk. The market turns sour, you're, you're in a bit of trouble. So I personally really like to find properties or projects to invest in that strong cash flow. The same is true when I do private lending to businesses. If I do private lending to a business, I want to make sure that business has really strong cash flow. I don't want to lend to a startup because then my only way to get to recuperate the cash because they're not cash flow positive is that they have a big buyout later or some cash flow in the future. That's risky. I like to bet on what is today, what is now. So private lending, I think the key is understanding how much you want to lend out, the time horizon you're comfortable with. I think in the long-term side, one to two years is very comfortable for private lending. If you want to put a mortgage on a property in the first secured position or second secured position, they call this first mortgages and second mortgages. When you're lending on your tax-free savings account and your RSP, you have to do that on uh, registered uh, mortgages. You have to use first, second, and third secured mortgages. You use companies like Olympia Trust to facilitate that lending for you. So you open a tax-free savings account or an RSP with someone like Olympia Trust, for instance, that will basically facilitate that lending for you. You can do it at non-arms length. Um, or sorry, at arm's length lending. You have someone that's basically at arm's length for you, not a family member that you can lend to. So someone that you've met at a networking event or someone's doing this, right? I think risk and return are really, really important. This is where I spend a lot of time trying to evaluate, you know, how do you decide what someone's risk is, right? There are agencies like Moody's that literally just rate debt. Bonds are, are, are publicly traded debt for companies, right? Their job is to go in and rate the riskiness of that debt. I do the same thing as a private lender when I'm investing my money on you should too. How risky is the investment I'm making? So land development, to someone who's not proven, we're gonna get to like the 10 things you gotta look for to, to determine viability, but there, like, there might be a ton of risk. So you may have to expect a really high return that's commensurate to the level of risk. When we talk about rate of return and structures, people can ask me, how do you structure it? First, I use what's simple. I have a handshake agreement with people. I build trust. I will send them my driver's license, my health card, all of these things that prove I am who I say I am. I will send bank statements. And we're gonna get to that in a minute. Credit, uh, credit score reports, all of these things. If you're private, the person borrowing your money isn't comfortable putting those things on the line, isn't comfortable showing you what's in their bank account, that's a red flag. 
So we're gonna get to what what to look for when you're trying to decide how to lend your money out. Because private lending is amazing, I think, in a retirement portfolio. I think if you're tired of being a landlord, you're, you don't want to do the work, or you just like you can't qualify for a mortgage. There are tons of positions where it makes a lot of sense to do private lending because you get really high rates of return, often 10, 12% rates of return, great cash flow. You know, if you have five hundred thousand dollars, you can have like 60 grand a year in passive income just by doing private lending. That's better than most dividend paying stuff. Any dividend paying stock I know that has similar risk, especially if you're invested in real estate or you're invested in uh, a real estate investor that's very, uh, well, we'll talk about the 10 factors that really has an A rating and how do you determine the rating of who you want to lend to. I know a lot of people in the network that lend just based on trust and they probably could benefit from looking at the 10 factors. Okay, so how, how are a lot of lending agreements that I see structured? So typically there'll be like a promissory note like three, four pages. They'll be often in there. If it's a promissory note from a company, it'll have no personal guarantee. Very risky. Red flag. Companies will borrow and they'll borrow from their real estate investing ventures. It'll be, it'll be like real estate co and it'll just borrow into the company and it'll have no personal guarantee. That's risky, especially like a one page agreement. Stay away from those as much as you possibly can or be compensated really, really well for that, right? You need to make sure that you're compensated very well for the risk that you're taking. So there's, that's how, how it's often structured, or it's a private mortgage, in which case the lawyer will do up a first secured charge on the title of the property. And if there's default, then you, instead of having to sue the person for the money, you basically take the property. You basically sue the person and take the property, power of sale, effectively. You get control of the property. You force the sale of the property. And if you're smart enough to make sure that you got a good appraisal on the property and the project, we're going to talk about that in a minute, how you value the project, then you're going to have enough, basically, capital or equity in the game you can get all your money back, get all your interest back, get some fees for your trouble, and then whatever's left over goes back to the real estate investor or the business owner whom you secured gains. So having collateral, having some secured gains is really, really important. Someone who has no money, you don't want to lend to them. Someone who's poor, you don't want to lend to them. You want to lend to people who have something to lose. We're going to get into all of that in just a second. So how do they structure the agreements? Beyond just the contracts I just explained, there'll be often a promissory note. I like to find promissory notes that are also personally guaranteed. I want the person to guarantee it, and I value the risk of the person. Maria, it's how you value the risk of the person in just a sec here. Um, I think that the best way is a personal guarantee, and ideally, you can verify the net worth. That's probably the safest way, because then you can just sue the person, and if the project that you're invested in goes south, the person also has a bunch of other money set aside. So I like to invest in people who have a lot of wealth. Unfortunately, people with a lot of wealth don't usually look for a lot of private money. Often they have their own private money or they're already connected to people who do and they have those relationships with people. Like I have good friends I could call and ask them for $50,000 and they just send that to me because we have that trust relationship, right? And they know all about the things that I'm doing. And so when you're investing in someone you don't know, it's a slightly different situation. I think even if you're investing in people you know, like friends and family, especially, especially family, trust me on that. I've made some family loans and I can say I wish I would have followed my own advice and follow the 10 steps we're going to talk about in just a minute. So hold on for that, guys. How do you structure it from a returns perspective? You'll see three, I think, types. And there's blends and variations on the spectrum between. But you have profit-sharing lending, which often has a balloon-type payment at the end. So an interest payment that's a balloon at the end. So imagine um, I'm, you know, I'm buying a property. I come to you looking to lend out the money. And I say, hey, I need $100,000. For this said property, I'm willing to share the profit with you as such 60 40. Let's say I get 60, you get 40. That's a profit sharing loan, private loan agreement. And you might say, I'll give you 3% fixed guaranteed rate of return on the project, and I'll pay you 40% of the upside profit, net of renovation costs and closing costs, et cetera. So if the project makes $40,000 or $50,000, I'm willing to give you $20,000 balloon payment at the end. That's a really risky and rich way of doing private lending, I think. Most of the people willing to sign those types of profit sharing agreements are really high risk. They know that no one's going to lend them on a guaranteed rate of return. They need that upside sweetener on the project. And oftentimes, they'll secure that as well to the property. So that's often something I see on the beginner end. People say, hey, if you can let me money to buy this deal, then I will go out there and I will give you 40% of the prop, profit and I'll do all the work. 
You see a lot of that in the beginner stages, people trying to figure out how to join venture, how to share profit. If they're not sure, they do it as a loan agreement. So you see it very, very common in private lending loans. The other way you see is like the, on the other side of the spectrum is the guaranteed rate of return. So all you get is a guaranteed rate and it's paid monthly. Whether the project fails, whether there's great success, you get a guaranteed rate of return. Much lower risk, because who knows what could happen. The flip could go sideways, there could be no profit, right? In that 60-40 split, you end up having negative return on your private funds. So it's more like a joint venture partnership, but it is a private lending form. So you get just your guaranteed 3%, end up with nothing other than the 3% you got negotiated in as your guaranteed rate in your blue, your blue payment would be basically like zero. You just get your principal back and that's it. So that's one way. And then the guaranteed rate being another way. I see on the really like first secured mortgages on a really safe project, we see 6% rates of return. Second mortgages, we see 8 to 15% rates of return. Very, very common in industry. You typically don't see above 15% unless you're doing unsecured lending to someone who has very little net worth. So just a promissory note, no guarantee on title of the property. You're just lending to that person. A lot of that lending happens in the network. I see a lot of people in Toronto and London. This People lend the money and, and that's it. There's no guarantees. And these people don't have great net worths and they don't meet the 10 criteria, but they still raise the capital. Because what you'll find is when you talk about money management and deal, the, the pyramid of what I think every real estate business and deal is built upon, people think that money is the most you know, valuable thing. And people who have none of it think the money is the hardest thing to get. And then they they... Often these people don't have a good management experience. They don't have the renovation experience. They don't even have a good deal. It's got like a realtor who up with a deal on MLS. So there's like, often what you're seeing in these situations is people have not a lot of experience, not a lot of mastery in any of these things, pay a lot for the money. And as you get more advanced, what you find is that you pay very little for the money because you've got the reputation, you've got the brand, you've done this a bunch of times, you've got a good track record, and you can go back and often, you know, get that money for a fixed rate of return of 8 or 10%. I'm in a position where I typically borrow three, eight, 10, sometimes 12%, depending on the need for the project. So that's basically at a high level. People jump into questions. There's a lot of comments here. I'm sure that I've missed. Okay, I'm gonna jump over here and try to grab all these lending questions here. Wow, there's a bunch of people jumping on. This is great. Um, I'm gonna jump to the YouTube and then I'm gonna jump to the Facebook and we're gonna talk all about private lending today because this is a good episode actually. I think private lending is a fantastic way to do everything. Okay, I'm going over to Instagram now, ready? Here we go. Mm-hmm. So we got that question out of the way. I see that one there. What's a recall period? Recall period. Oh, recall. Okay, so if you wanted to, uh, yeah, I thought that was like a term, like recall, recall. Is it like real estate council or something? I'm like trying to, okay, so that's a lot easier than I thought. So what's a, the recall period? Typically, there'll be a period where if the loan is structured in an unsecured fashion, so you've got a situation where you've lent someone some money and there's no determined payback period. Often you get a good thing going with someone. You say, hey, you can keep my money. Keep rolling it. You keep paying me a passive income return. I'm happy. That's what a lot of a lot of investors will say that. And then they're, you know, basically the borrower is like, okay, cool. I'll keep rolling to the next project. We'll do another flip right after. They keep using the money. That's that's what I want typically. I don't want the money back. I want them to keep it and keep growing it. So the recall period is if you need the money back. You put that in the contract, you have the right to recall the loan with a certain amount of notice. So it might be 30 days, 60 days, it could be 15 days. Often it's 30 to 90 days. I see in, in the agreements there, you say, hey, if it's an unsecured loan, like a promissory note, it's a personal guarantee that you've let someone to do a business or a project, you'll say, hey, okay, um, I might need that money back. Can I give you 30 days notice to recall that money? And that's something that you have to basically contractually do. If they can't recall the money and you can't agree on a time. Let's say they you try to recall the money. They say, I can't pay you back right now. I'm in the middle of the split. I'm knees deep. I need two months, three months. You say, I can't give you three months. Often there'll be a bit of flexibility. And like you work with your lender and you say, hey, like, please, can I just have two months? I'll pay you a premium. Okay, no problem. You work something out. But in those situations where you have to recall the money and they can't refinance the money to pay you back, that's when they go into default position when you try to recall it. So recall period is how long basically to recall the money. Uh, it's typically how I've seen it done. So 30, 60, 90 days to get your money back. You just got to give them you know, written notice, say, hey, I need the money back uh, in 30 days or 60 days as per our contractual agreement. And often you work with them, you get your money back. You got to let them know that you need, the money, you need the money back for them to go and put another lender in place, right? Either a bank or someone else to buy out basically with another mortgage 
the money you had invested in that real estate project or to borrow from someone else, or they maybe just put their own money in. When I often get recalls, I keep, personally, I like to keep about a quarter million dollars liquid. And so if someone would recall a loan for me for hundred grand, I would likely use all my lines of credits that I personally, or I would use like HELOC, or I would use my personal cash reserves and I'd pay them back and then I'd find someone else to go onto the property. Uh, yeah, so that's essentially what a recall period is. And you want to make sure you have that in your, in your contract. A lot of people don't. And then when it comes time they need that money for something, they want to get it back from the guy they invested with. And he's like, what do you mean? I need six months. And you're just stuck. Because you didn't write anything in your contract. that says, hey, I can recall the money at this time. And there's these sorts of terms. So be very careful on the terms that you put in with your private lending. Be very careful with that, guys. So great question. Uh, GB55, their sub-brand. Good to see you on. Jonas, good to see you on. Bunch of people on here. Hashtag private lending. Awesome. So what type of legal documents should a person get if private lending? I think people overcomplicate things and oftentimes simpler can be better, but the contract is only as good as the person you're lending to. And we're going to get to the 10 ways you evaluate someone. And if you just hold on guys, if you're watching this on the replay, just click to the end and you can literally, like in a few minutes from now, we'll get to the ways you actually evaluate the borrower. And it's really important, I think, as well. But if you're lending out, you basically got a particular promissory note agreement or a lending agreement. There's tons online you can use. You could go to a lawyer and get one drawn up, but the nuts and bolts of it are you want to grab a couple of them online and see that there are certain categories covered. I could share a couple. I could share some links of some. You just do a Google search for yourself. Type in like lending agreement or loan agreement or um, type in a collateral loan agreement. You can type in like a note. See like so you could type in like use note instead of loan. You'll see it. Just search those key terms. You'll see a bunch of sample contracts for free online. I don't know why people pay lawyers like two grand to develop these contracts when like go with them for free online, just read through them and make some minor modifications. I've done a lot of private lending. I've borrowed a lot of money and I've lent out a lot of money. And I just use like my own three, four page agreement. At the end of the day, I think it comes down to the trust you built with the person. And oftentimes the agreement is more just getting things on paper, what you already agree on in person. And if the person is reasonable, then you're not going to have a lot of issue or risk with private lending, especially if you follow them. I'm going to get to this in a minute, but like social proof is so important. If I can't watch my private lender on Facebook and Instagram, or like at least on social media and see what they're doing on a daily basis with my money, I don't feel comfortable. That's just me. Um, but anyway, we're going to get to that in a little bit here. But some of the things I think that are important when you're dealing with private lending, because there's a ton of juice and I should have leveraged this in the beginning, but I'm trying to help you guys and keep you to the end because I promise you're not going to be disappointed. I've made an extensive list of how I evaluate my lenders and then I'll actually, those people who want to invest with me, they say to make the ask. I should have probably done that at the beginning, but if you want to invest with me, I have several projects going on right now that you could lend me money on. I don't need the money that bad, but I've got to make the ask. I'm going to pay 10% all day and I will show you all 10 of the criteria. Things like sending you my credit score and my net worth, my personal bank accounts, things, all this kind of stuff to those seriously qualified uh, people who have capital they want to, to work. It's like a lot of projects that get put to work. What you realize is when you give away half of the profit, that's a lot to give away when you're a top executor. And there's not a lot of people, I, I'm just starting to realize this now, but when you get to the top of your game, right? Like the number of deals I've done, and I'm probably in the top 10 residential real estate investors. I, I'm definitely top three in London, for sure. The volume, the amount of work that we've done, I'm in the top of my game, right? There's not a lot of people who can consistently 50 deals in a row Buy and make $100,000 again and again and again. Have a track record like I do and talk about how we how you do that. But anyway, so we'll get into that in a minute. But if anyone does want to actually do any lending, I do have a couple of projects. I have a fourplex in London for $190,000. ARV is probably three hundred dollars or higher. It cash flows really well. It can pay the interest at 10% or 12% on the entire purchase price all day long. So without us doing any work to the property, it's self-servicing. We get a little bit of, a little bit of trouble is when you lend to flippers who have carrying costs, the project goes long, they have no rental income coming in to cover their costs or not enough to cover the expensive mortgage, you get into some trouble. So anyway, we'll get into that in a sec. Uh, I had to make the ask because, you know, it's good to make the ask. Someone told me, hey, my guests are asking. People aren't going to know that you want to borrow capital if you don't start throwing it out there. So I'm going to throw it out there um, and just, just share that right with the world. Because at the end of the day, the nice thing about private lending is this. If you're if all of my real estate investing friends watch this too. A lot of them are thinking, hey, you know, how do I decide whether they want to join a venture partner or they want to just borrow the money? If you borrow the money, there's no questions asked. 
If you don't deliver, let's say like it takes you an extra two months to finish your renovation, instead of making 100,000 profit, you make $80,000 profit, but the lender has no questions. If they're paid their interest every month and pay back in full, it doesn't matter. It's very low stress, really easy way to do things when you do private lending. You don't have to go through the banks, you don't have to provide the same level of scrutiny that you would with a joint venture partner, where the partner is going to ask you for updates all the time. They're going to be following up. So there's a lot of things to think about when you want to decide whether you want to join venture partner or whether you want to do lending. With the lending, you take a lot more risk. If the project fails in a joint venture, the joint venture partner is going to lose the money. It's not necessarily always your money. So that's something to think about. If it uh, fails on the lending side, I've actually never had a failed project. 60 something properties now. I've never made less than, I've actually never not made money. So it actually would have made way more sense for me to always just borrow capital. So that's something I've been kind of thinking about and saying, hey, I should create this. And I also want to do this mentee fund. There's a lot of things I want to do with the money and help get these kids their financial independence and help them buy properties and teach them how to fish. So yeah, I do that with some capital. And so if we make some investors some money along the way, that'd be cool too. But anyway, we're going to get to the 10 ways that you uh, evaluate whether an investment decision is risky or how much risk is there. Because the amount of risk determines whether you're comfortable or not, right? You may not be comfortable with a really high risk level. You may need to meet a certain threshold. And maybe you are super, you know, you're not risk averse at all. You're, you're open to risk, you have a good appetite for it. And if you do, then you need to make sure you're getting a, a return that's commensurate to the risk. So if it's a really high risk person or high risk project, you need to make sure you're getting a good uh, level of return for that. So if you're letting someone super, super risky, I like to see 20% return, but there are often times where I see really high returns for people who are taking big risk. So I follow online who do private lending and they are getting like 30% return, or like almost such a criminal, a certain interest rate you can't charge higher than. I'm not sure what their interest rate is, but I know like the payday money loans and all those money market guys, there's a certain rate you can't charge higher than. It's criminal after a certain rate. I see a lot of guys doing the criminal lending side. Like they're actually lending rates that are like ridiculously criminal. Fixed rates of return, like 50% or 80% on your money. And those types of returns often are associated with very high risk. Anyone willing to borrow at that rate is either dumb, bad, or going to fail. Dumb, bad, or going to fail. If you're borrowing at like 50 or 80 or 100% rates of return, you're probably dumb. <laughs> you if you were smart, if you were smart, you'd be good, right? That's why I say bad, right? If you were good, you'd be able to borrow the money cheaply. Good people who have really good track records and really good, you know, lines of credits with the banks often have really easy time raising money, right? It's the people who don't have an easy time raising money need to pay the high cost because risk is the reward. Hey, uh, I'm gonna finish a couple more questions, then I'm gonna jump over to the YouTube. And we're going to do all the questions that pop up there as well. There's a bunch of these are some really good ones. Um, can first position be written into promissory notes? You could write it in. Like you write it into the conduct and say, hey, I'm lending this person in the unsecured position, but I want personal guarantee against their net worth. And if the project is that I'm lending for this project and upon sale of the project, I want to be repaid in full. You can put that in the contract. And that's often what I do when the project sells. You know, I send it off to their lawyer or I send it off to the person. I often get paid out. Um, I don't I don't ever register on title. I know I probably should. I evaluate the person more than I evaluate the title because there's a lot of legal fees associated and stress associated with that. Um, so th that's a good question. But uh, technically, you have to register a first. You could register, go take a, a loan and register it against the property. You would put a second charge or first charge mortgage. If there's already a first charge mortgage from a major bank or something on the property, then you have to register in the second position or third position or fourth position and so on and so forth. And the person in the first position has first right to get their money back and their interest. And then if you're in the second position, you have whatever's left over. And in the third position, whatever's left over. And the last position is the investor's equity, which is if there's any left over, the investor gets paid on the force of the sale of the property. Often in this market we're in right now where things are appreciating a ton, the first lender gets paid back easily, the second lender gets paid back, and there's still equity left over for the investor, just not near as much as they would have liked. And often it's because they defaulted on their interest payments. So Make sure when we talk about one of the 10 things is liquidity. When I talk about liquidity, having enough cash to service things. There are guys who are maxed out and strapped out. Those people are not people that you should probably be lending to. It's taking a big risk. They're close to insolvency, which just leads to bankruptcy. If you don't have enough cash to meet your financial obligations, be it renovations, be it whatever. So can it be written? Yes, you could take a loan and you could register in the first secured position. Uh, you have to have a lawyer go ahead and register that on title of the property. So if whoever owns the property, say it's investor X owns the property, 
you as the lender can go ahead and register a mortgage on that property for the amount that you know basically you borrowed. So that was a cool uh, cool question. Thank you for asking that. Cool, cool, cool. Let's see if I missed any questions here. I don't think I missed any. I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. What do you think of syndications? Uh, be very careful syndications. Um, syndicated mortgages. We've seen a lot of, they're very complex. And we've seen a lot of corruption and a lot of failure. I like the fact that like when you syndicate, basically it's a nice way of saying like bringing many things together. What you find is that you, if you have many different mortgages, right? You're like a basket of 100 mortgages together. There should be less risk than one mortgage by itself. So in theory, bringing together a package of you know mortgage notes or like private loan notes together is much less risky than investing in one person or one note. So in theory, diversity is safety. Um, what we often see is the management fees associated with people bringing these syndications together. They're very high. And we're going to talk about private lender fees too, because what you'll find is you go on Kijiji, you'll find 50 private lenders, people all trying to you know broker between investors with a ton of money. And people trying to borrow the money, can be real estate investors. So you got investors with money who are like lenders, and then you've got the broker who's got a, a license and they're regulated. There's certain things they have to follow, and they put the two together. To put together an investor with a lender, that requires a mortgage license. You can't put those two together. I know people doing it on Facebook and Instagram. I follow them on their, on their stuff, and I know they're doing it without a mortgage license. They will go to jail, they're taking a big risk. Same with joint venture partner. You got to be very careful. There are certain guidelines you have to follow the Securities Commission to not offer security. And I know a lot of people breaking the rules there too, and they haven't been caught yet, but they will. I don't like to go offside. It's not me. So I don't like syndicating mortgages requires certain legislative compliance. And people try to get at this as amateurs or without those proper licenses, and they get in big trouble and end up in jail and lose everything. So just just be careful. There's a lot of a lot of stuff that's bad in the industry. A lot of stuff to be careful of in the industry. Um, do your research. Private lending doesn't have to be scary. I think at the end of the day, we follow the 10 things I'm going to tell you in just a minute about how to evaluate risk and how to determine the quality of the borrower when you're a borrower and you'll be okay. So good question. Pace of bass or Emma. Um, is it pace? Oh, pace of bass. Sorry, my bad. My bad. I saw that and I just I didn't see two S's. I don't know why. Like extremely hot and tired right now. Okay. Um, going down. Did I miss any other ones here? That's a strange, I love you, baby. That's, that's a weird one. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, how does a person who lended via private lending get taxed on their received payments? So this is a mechanical question. I should do these questions more at the end. I should finish the 10, but I want to keep you guys hooked and keep you guys watching. So stay tuned. Um, how does... Okay, so when you have rental income on a rental property, it's business income. So you have the rental income, you have all your expenses and your net profit. That is taxed at your act, at your marginal tax bracket. So your regular tax bracket. Lending income is taxed the exact same way as regular business income, rental income. It's the exact same thing. You make $1,000 in profit on your rental property a month. It's the tax the exact same way as $1,000 in income from lending. So tax the same way. It's declared on your tax return in a different spot on your other income. You could incorporate and you could lend out from your, your lending corporation if you wanted to. And then whether you lend personally or through a corporation, you can create write-offs. So if you drive down to visit and check on the projects they're working on and you go for lunch, that's a write-off and you maybe spend 200 bucks on a gift card because you want to sweeten the deal with your, I don't know, person's borrowing from you. I don't know why you do that, but you could. All those things are write-offs. The gas, uh, you, you can have write-offs against your lending income to get it down effectively for tax purposes. You can write off a piece of your, your rent. If you rent in Toronto and you use your second bedroom as an office and the only outside business activity you do is lend out money. Hey, guess what? Maybe 20% of your rent is a write-off against that lending income. Be smart. You can definitely do that. 100%. Private lending is fantastic from a tax perspective in the same way that real estate investing is because you can write off things against it that were directly attributed to the cost. If you borrow from your home equity line of credit and lend that out, the interest paid on your home equity line of credit, say it's three, four percent, you lend out ten percent, you make the spread between ten and three or four percent, say you're making six percent spread. That three or four percent interest on from your HELOC or your unsecured line of credit or wherever you borrow that money from is a tax deduction, is a write-off. I'm not an accountant, I'm not an expert on that, but I did study a little bit of tax stuff. So 
I don't know. I do have a, a basic idea. That is my understanding. Venmo Brian says, hey Mike, I own three properties, all in cash, just worth under half a million dollars. Congratulations, that's $1.5 million. That is amazing. Um, I want to pull money out, so what are my options? Should I do a cash out refi? Um, first question is watch the last or have you watched last week's video, the Mike Rosart show, where I talked about on that channel how having money sitting in a dead property is really bad. So the I guess the short answer is, is the property cash flowing? If it can cash flow and pay the debt that you're going to go borrow on that property, it can make good sense to keep the property, avoid capital gains tax, and effectively go from having $1.5 million earning you very little to then borrowing all that money and lending it out. You can go ahead and make yourself a good six figures in passive income, probably net of the carrying costs. So yes, I would say it's a great idea to take that money and put it to work. Because you can go borrow three or 4%, and go make that money work for you at 10%. You get the spread. That's an amazing position to be in. That's a great question, Venmo. Uh, hey, bro, saw you on YouTube and added you here. Andre, it's awesome. Good to see you on. You just want to keep building wealth. The properties are also always rented out. Yeah, so if you just want to keep building wealth, the nice thing about refinancing your property is if further appreciation does happen, then you stand to benefit from that without having your money tied up in that property. So that's that's huge. Um, you have to pull the money out of the property, continue your experience of appreciation and any cash flow you have. Of course, you have debt servicing obligations now. If the property can self-service after you finish the uh, after you finish putting on the new mortgage, after the mortgage interest payments, you're in a great position because now you've got a whole bunch of money at 1.5 million. I'm sure you can borrow at least a million dollars of that if your properties have decent rental income and you have a decent day job. It's very likely to be able to borrow a million bucks. Take a million bucks, lend a million bucks out of 10, 12%. You've got $120,000 a year at 12% in passive income coming in. I guarantee your holding costs are like $30,000 or $40,000. So you're looking at about an $80,000 spread just by allocating the money you already had in your properties to better use. So don't own properties in cash. You know I hate owning properties in cash. The ROI is way too low. Go refinance the money out or just sell the properties in general. Uh, are you living in London or Ontario? I live in London, Ontario. So <laughs> London, Ontario. Gabe, good to see you on. See some people on there. Uh, okay, great idea. I didn't even think about that. There you go. So glad I can help. Let's go on to the next question. Let's jump over here to YouTube. Okay, I'm gonna find my spot here. Hi, Mike. Which credit cards do you use for which purchases, like Tangerine, Mastercard for home improvements, recurring bills, etc.? How do you maximize cash back points and returns? Um, I like the World Elite card. It's fantastic. Two percent cash back. Um, I like the World League Grocery card, the PC card. There's a really good Rogers card that I had for a while. Um, I like the MBNA 0% credit card because I can borrow $12,000 on that at 0% interest for a year. There's a 1%, it might be 2% now, fee when you borrow. So you're effectively borrowing like ten or $12,000 for a whole year deposited into your bank account from your credit card at like a 2% lending cost. I take that money and I go on and I invest that in something else. Make ten percent, and I make the spread. So I love that credit card as well. And the Amazon card is pretty good. The Marriott Bonvoy card is fantastic. Has some of the best returns from a points perspective of any card. And no international currency fees when you are, for instance, using a credit card in the United States or another country. There's no transaction fees. Most Mastercards and Visas, pretty much all of them, charge you. They bake in like a little two percent extra fee on the exchange. So the exchange rate isn't as favorable. This one's literally at. Uh, literally at the exchange rate, so they don't skim at all. I'm now going to go and give you guys the 10 things, and then we're going to jump back to the questions, because there's so many questions here. I'll be here like an hour just trying to get these questions down. Okay, so back to the synopsis. So there's the amount of money you're comfortable lending. There's the timeline you're comfortable with, short-term private lending versus long-term private lending. There's risk level you're comfortable with, and the way you determine risk level is project type and the borrower profile. Now I'm going to go deeper on that. So there's types of projects you can lend. You can lend to businesses. You could lend to individuals for certain things. I never recommend lending for like to buy cars or lending people money to buy stuff. That, that depreciates. Not good. I like to only lend against things that cash flow and generate past by generating passive income and appreciate. So I guess that's really two things: cash flowing, profit. I guess you can have no cash flow and have profit technically. Um, if you're reinvesting back in your business. So I guess there are three. But basically profit, cash flow, and appreciation. 
So I want the business to be growing in value. I want the real estate that I'm investing in to be growing in value, or I want to see that there's strong, strong cash flow. So I don't want to invest in businesses that have no cash flow, that are gonna have cash flow in the future. I get a lot of messages on Instagram, people jumping in and saying, hey Mike, can you lend me $500,000 for my new business idea? I got this like clothing line or this cool app I'm working on. And I, by the way, I love those apps and I want to, I actually am down to partner with people and provide some of my time and my expertise to help them build a real cool brand or product or something around that. But I'm not gonna dump a bunch of money. And I don't think you should either into something that's not proven. But very scary. Okay, so we're into the 10, 10 ways you evaluate a borrower. So things I look at. One, track record. This is the most important thing, followed second by net worth. So track record, net worth, and liquidity are my top three favorites. There's 10, I'm gonna get to all 10 in a second here. But so the first one is track record. So we're gonna get into what that means in a minute. Net worth, how do you measure that? And I literally want them to have accountant prepared net worth statements. I like to invest in millionaires. And I want to go and find out if that net worth is actually what they're claiming it to be. The next one is liquidity. I want to see bank accounts. I want to see investment accounts. I want to see how much cash they have. A lot of real estate investors have no money, zero. And they got lots of real estate, millions of real estate. Maybe net of all the debts, they don't have a huge net worth. Maybe they only have a couple hundred thousand dollars of positive net worth because they got you know six, seven properties and six, seven mortgages. And the mortgages are almost as much as the properties are worth. You got to be very careful. These guys often have bad credit scores too. They've been delinquent on payments. That's a red flag. So we've got first track record. So they've done a lot of deals. I like to see someone who's done like 30, 40 deals, a lot of deals, at least five. I don't want to invest in someone who's never done a deal before. If you've done like less than three deals, that's a big risk from a private lending perspective because they're unproven. You want them to have documented those deals. You want to see legal documents that they've done deals or social media proof that they've been doing this for a long time. They have, they've been doing it, right? So first thing, track record, net worth, they need to be wealthy. If the person's not a millionaire, I don't feel comfortable. If the project fails, can I take it from their bank account? If the house blows up and there's insurance will cover it and worst case scenario happens, you try to repossess the home and power sale, there's nothing left in a very, very worst case apocalyptic scenario. I go after the person's investment accounts because they gave me a personal guarantee. I go after that person's cash, go after that person's personal house, or go after everything. So net worth is very important. I want to make sure the person's wealthy. Now, people just getting up and started don't necessarily have as good of a net worth, but if they can prove they got a good narrative, it's net worth change over time is really important to me as well. Are they becoming wealthier? So first, uh, I'm going to repeat myself, track record, net worth, liquidity, credit score. Go to creditkerma.ca or .com. You can pull your own credit score and see exactly what the credit score is. Someone has less than a 700 credit score, red flag. If they can't pay their e-lenders and their other obligations, that's probably a red flag. They're probably not going to be on time paying you. They're probably not going to be on time with their payments to you. They're probably not going to pay you back when you want them to. So that's something to think about as credit score. The banks look at it, you should too. And I don't pull credit on people. I often will get them just to submit something. I get them to take like a piece of paper, like the paper, or take a picture of their phone. So I can tell the time when they took that picture, et cetera. And I trust people. For the most part, there's not been a lot of Photoshopping or anything like that. Especially with the other documents all lining up, the story starts to make sense. So you got track record, net worth, liquidity, credit score. Then I look at social proof. So I go in and see, do they have a good network of people to surround themselves with? Do they go up to the real estate investing uh, meetups? Do people know them in the community? Like, what is their, their social identity look like? Are they on Instagram? Can I watch my investment on the daily on Instagram or Facebook and see what they're doing with my money? That's important to me, especially if they're doing real videos, not just random posts. I can see they're physically in this location doing X and Y, and they're working towards repaying me my money because I'm investing in the person completing on the project. And so that's really, really important that they actually do execute on what they say they're going to do. Um, okay, so where was I? I talked about social proof. The next one would be lifestyle and spending habits. This one's less important, but I still factor in as a, like the 10th thing, like the minor thing, is that I don't want to invest in someone. Like, there are guys who... Just are spend crazy. You see these celebrities that go from millionaire to broke because they're living a baller lifestyle, they're living in a mansion, they're living with like a fancy car. And most people see that fancy car in you know, a Rolls Royce or whatever they're driving and that big house and they think, that person's made it, I gotta lend to them. You actually wanna lend to the millionaire next door. The guy's got the average house, the average car, that person's burn rate is very low. So if a project goes bad, a frugal investor or somebody who's very astute with their money, 
If they're astute with their own money, I think they'll be more astute with my money too. If they're really good with their own money and managing their own personal finances and not spending a lot, they're probably good at cost control on the real estate flipping side or whatever else. If they're good with cost control, that's a check mark for me. Plus, if they're super frugal, I know they're not gonna burn through all the money they have. Because sometimes they're really good in that worth, but their lifestyle is super extravagant. That's a risk to me. I, I, I feel very uncomfortable lending to someone who's you know, maybe not as frugal. Someone who's frugal, like I have a $25,000 a year burn rate for my family. That's what we live on, to serve, you know, everything. After my house hack situation, my burn rate's like $10,000 a year. That means I need from all my sources of income about $10,000 to keep me afloat. If I had a burn rate of 100,000 or 200,000, a lot of real estate investors that I meet have those high burn rates. They got the nice car and the fancy house. If the real estate market goes sour, they'll start dipping into their cash flow and they're going to support their family before they're going to pay back their loans to me. So I like actually, I'm going to go through what the ideal profile looks like, but I think spending habits and lifestyle is really important. I want someone that's a low flight risk. They're not going to leave the country. You know, someone who's, who's stable, has roots in the community. I think social proof helps with that. Um, next one is online presence. I like to see my investment. I like to see that they're working on the project. I like to get updates. I don't want someone who's going to ghost and then respond to my email a week later. Um, that's not ideal. I like to see if they're alive and I don't have to worry about my money. That's a minor thing, but it's still obviously important. Um, I type in flight risk and like risk of non-payment back to you, right? Because that's what we're evaluating. What is the riskiness that they're not going to pay you on time, not going to pay you back? Um, just screw you right over. You know, I'm going to make sure that you look for red flags. I think flight risk is a big one. Something to lose is a big one too. Like that goes back to the net worth, I think, and liquidity. Someone who's close to insolvency. They're going to have big issues down the line, right? If they have no cash flow, they're going to start dipping in other projects, and that's where things get really messy really fast. So people who are really spendy, they're taking big risks. That's more of a red flag lending to someone like that. So okay, uh, referrals is important too. I want to see other people have lent to them, and I want to talk to that person, or at least see a letter of referral from that person that hey, you've borrowed money from someone else, and that person has been paid back in full on time. That's important too. Um, I need to do a better job on class. All my people. I've lent to and asked them for letters of referral. So I can have that and say, hey, you know, that's part of my pitch to people I'm talking to. If I'm trying to borrow money as a real estate investor, you need to have a, a folder together with all of your all your pertinent information. And maybe you make the lender sign a non-disclosure so they don't share your net worth stuff. That's important. I think you should do that, but you should be sharing that. A lot of people are lending without seeing that kind of documentation. It's a bit of a risk. The last is investment style. Um, so I think that investment style is more the kind of projects they're working on, um, other business interests they have. I like to look for investors that are strong in cash flow because strong cash flow portfolios hold up in recessions. So I get paid back and everything is good to go. So I feel really good about private lending where they're, they're very focused. They have a great track record on you know, that investment style. They're an expert and that's their main focus. Some of maybe got, you know, full-time job and they've got eight other businesses and they've got you know a million other things that are holding them back and they got this one little thing that's like the real estate investing. Maybe they're taking there's times to spread and able to finish the project. Or maybe um, their investment style doesn't jive with mine. Maybe their thing is like land development. Or maybe their thing is like flipping and that's all they do. If they're if I'm lending them on one project, what if another project tanks and I end up needing or they end up using my funds to save the other project, which happens a lot. You gotta be careful. They're gonna take your take your funds, use them for another project. And then you evaluate this one project and you look at the whole picture. So that's why when I lend, I look at the whole picture. I don't really care about the project as much as I do about the whole picture. A lot of people get stuck on like, what property am I helping them buy? But if an investor like, you can use me as an example, you can walk through this test with me because I don't know, it's the only example I have right now, but um, let, let's do it. So. First, so I'm gonna do, there's track record, credit score, net worth, spending habits, and lifestyle, liquidity, social proof, and referrals, having something to lose, online presence, flight risk, and uh, family, community. They're part of groups, part of networking groups. They, they're seen in the community. They're, they have kids. Ideally, they have family and kids in the area, too. They have no family, no friends, no, no nothing tied into the area. That's a risk, too. They have kids in school. They're probably not going to go fly off to like Venezuela, right? Like they're probably going to stay here and they'll work their debt off. Because I know people, if a project fails, 
I want them. I want to know that they can work that debt off to pay me back. Even if the project fails, even if they don't have the money personally, they'll work until they pay me back. Uh, and then the last is investment style uh, of that person. So where would I start? So if I was starting at the first thing, net worth, I would send, and I do send, part of when I borrow from people, I send them a net worth statement that outlines all of my personal holdings. I will make a line item that notes I have shares in my company, right, my management, and I also own like 38 properties in the corporate. but I don't give them my corporate documents because I'm not borrowing from the corporation. But if I, was borrow, if I was borrowing money in my corp, I would give all my financials, my income statements, my balance sheets, everything on my corp, and then I would give everything personally as well. So that's that's a big thing to look for. I, I like to see, if you're getting an example, like let's say me, what would my profile look like? My credit score floats between 850 and 760 typically, right? On a good day, I'll have like an 860 credit score depending on how much I've borrowed and what my current uh, applications are like. I applied for a lot of credit recently, but bumped back down to 750, 760. It floats in that range. I have a really strong credit. Like I have very good or excellent credit. That's important. So I would have a full check under credit score. So if you're evaluating my portfolio, you would say, okay, Mike has really good credit. He has borrowed 20 mortgages. I can see that on his credit report and he's paid them all back. He has, and on the credit report, you can literally they can take snapshots if there's any collections. Has anyone ever filed collections against them? That's important. That's where credit score is really important. Have they ever declared bankruptcy? Have all the things in the credit report are very important. You need to know the credit score. You need to look at the credit report to understand the risk level. But it's just one piece, right? Because this credit score is actually quite broken. And you can be broke and making minimum payments on all your credit cards and still have a great credit score, but be broke and a loser. So credit score is just one piece. I think credit score is important because it shows you have a lot of types of credits, but able to maintain those types of credits. So credit score is important. Second thing about evaluating myself, doing this like whole like risk profile thing, uh, track record. I would say, okay, show me the deals. Show me pictures of befores and afters of properties. I want to see on social media you've been doing this for a long time. Not six months or a year, you're brand new at this. I want to see you've been investing in real estate for two, three, four, five years, maybe longer, six, seven. In my case, I'm investing in real estate for eight and a half years. So I have a decent track record. I've been doing this intently full time for more than two years. I'm a lot less risky than say someone in the category you might compare to who's maybe never done uh, deals or done two deals. And so you're looking to, to blend to two people. One is clearly more risky than the other. And you should clearly get a higher return. Like if I'm put up against some brand new real estate investors done like three deals in Toronto, I should get a way better rate of return because remember we talked about in the initial conversation, risk to reward. The higher the risk the person is to not pay you back and pay you back on time, the higher the return you should expect. That's why I said there's a range between six and 15% rates of return. Now, a blue, blue ocean or an oasis can happen where the really safe investment, like myself, I never ask for money. So I, I don't borrow, I actually don't have borrow. I don't have any money out right now. I've paid back all my private money. I have none out right now. I don't owe any money to anyone other than A-letter banks. So I'm in a really good position, right? Someone who's maybe borrowed a whole bunch from a whole bunch of people might be in a more risky position. You should expect as soon as they their financial position has changed that you get a better return based on the risk. But sometimes you get people like me who don't have anything borrowed. Like I pretty much check all of these boxes really well. Um, I'm an example of someone who would be a really safe bet. And if I borrowed your money at like 10%, that's a good deal because there are people in the same profile as me that will char- that will borrow at six or seven percent. So you're getting arbitrage. The video ended due to poor connection. Okay, so is, am I still live or did the internet just die altogether? You should. I don't know. I'm, I'm back on. I lost all the questions that were on there. I didn't get to them. I don't know why the stream just died, but we're still on on this one. So is. Someone tell me we're still live on YouTube. Okay, we're still live. Cool. We lost Instagram, but we're still live. Uh, I guess people are going to lose the recording. And on Instagram, you guys can just go back and check it out on YouTube on the Mike Rosart Show or on the Facebook channel. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Hey, so let's go back through how you evaluate someone as a real example. So credit score. You've got credit scores anywhere from 300 points to 900 points. And you, if someone's got like a 500 credit score, they've probably had a collections... Uh, claim against them, like they've not paid a debt and someone's come after them, or they've like major screwed up. So when they send you their credit report, you can look at that. There's only a section that says like, have any claims been against you? And like when I, when people used to borrow from money, me, I would take pictures on Credit Karma of literally like never had a collection against me, never missed a payment, all let debts pay back in full. Like I just literally would take my credit report and send it to them. 
It's like, hey, that's that's a check mark. That's a positive on the credit report. Next is net worth. My net worth, I'm not gonna share it because I don't want to share it on, with the world anymore, but I have several million dollars. So my net worth is very, very positive. Meaning if I sold all of my assets and pay back all of my debts, I would have a lot of money left over. That means if a project goes bad, you can pretty much guarantee you're gonna get paid back. If I give you on the personal uh, loan agreement or on the loan agreement or the the note that we signed, if I get a personal guarantee, that's and I say this like it's probably better that I gave a personal guarantee than if I gave a first secured mortgage. It's more likely the project would fail and the investor would not get paid back after taking power of sale from me on the deal than it is that I would not that I would ever have less than a couple million dollars. I'm so frugal, my burn rate is so low that yeah, anyway. I'm not going to talk about that anymore because I don't want to help myself. That's not the point of this. The point is to show you guys how to evaluate the borrower. So I want you guys to make smart decisions when you're letting your money out. Okay, so credit score, uh, track record. So you look and see how many deals they've done, the types of deals they've done, have they made profit on their deals. Um, they might even be willing to send you their tax return. That'd be kind of cool. I've never done that, but I suppose I'd be willing to redact my social insurance numbers and stuff and maybe share some of that. I don't know if I want to share that with the world, but stuff like that could. You could have them share with you as well. It depends how invasive you want to be. The more invasive you, you are, you want to try to stealthily collect as much information as you can. Most people go to private borrowers because they don't want to go through the Rick and Morel. When I go for a, like, with a private, with an A lender, because when I go through an A lender, as an example, guys, hopefully the yeah, live stream is back up over here. When I go to an A lender, they want to see the lease agreements on all of my properties. That's like a good. My lending application to an A-Lender is like 250 pages. It takes me like a week to prepare my, all my stuff because I have so much stuff going on, right? And sending like literally bank statements and all that stuff is a lot of work. With private lending, you can send less. And so you have to make a decision on less information, unfortunately. But I think you can do it with a few key documents and make a really safe decision. Um, so anyway, track record, you would evaluate what they've done, the types of projects they've done. Um, all that kind of stuff to determine what is the track record. Have them prepare for you some pictures of before and after, maybe some addresses they've done. If they've done 20 flips, like in my case, I would say, hey, I've sold, you know, 12 properties already. They were all successful. I could show that. If you have 55 buildings, I would show each. I could talk about each property. You could dive in. You could probe them on one or two properties to make sure it's real, especially if they don't have a social presence. And you might have to verify some of this stuff yourself. At the end of the day, I feel really comfortable meeting someone. Going to their house, seeing where they live, going and seeing their tangible assets if they have properties, go and see them. That's something that's kind of uh, reassuring. That's always been something I've done. It's more maybe uh, back of the envelope style. It's worked really well for ensuring repayment on private lending. Uh, okay, so then we got spending habits, lifestyle. That one's a tough one, but you can kind of tell. Like you go to their house, you see how they live, see the kind of car they drive. You can get a pretty good guess about how much money they're spending. And I like to look for the millionaire next door. Great book, by the way. If you haven't read the book, go check it out. Um, talks about the, that millionaire next door is like the guy lives in like an average house who's been like, he's got like two million bucks or a million bucks. They've saved I'm the millionaire next door. So it'll be a million bucks plus, which like back when the book was written, it's like the same as a few million today, in my opinion, because you know, inflation, buying power, and whatnot. I think really like, being a millionaire today, just having $1 million, not to like shit on anyone, but that's anyone in their lifetime can become a millionaire. It doesn't matter what your income level is. Even if you're on minimum wage, you can become a millionaire in your lifetime. So um, I think the hurdle is now even higher to be like at the top points in that category for net worth. You'd be pretty wealthy. Um, liquidity, really important. A lot of people don't have liquidity set aside. It's a ch tough challenge. I'm like, on one hand, liquidity means I have money sitting there doing nothing. Dying to inflation. Like money millions are not working for me, not earning anything and just dying. That feels really bad as an investor. On the other hand, you need to have some cash reserves. You need to have some liquidity to ensure your business doesn't become insolvent. What if something pops up at a property? Make sure you at least have lines of credits accessible or something accessible that'll ensure, you know, at the end of the day, if something comes up, if five furnaces come up all at once and five roofs and something else happens, you get some vacancy, that you can carry those costs for a month or two until things pick back up. Ideally, they have a portfolio that also is full of businesses and real estate that cash flows really well. Because if one has a dip, the others can cover. Like if I'm making $30,000 a month in rental income, profit, cash flow, if one property is vacant, 
I mean, I'm not 29,000, 28,000. Oh, wow, that's okay. There's strength in, in numbers. If you've got really strong cash flow properties, a lot of real estate investors don't. They have properties in Toronto that don't cash flow, or properties in London, like around here in Northwest London, that they bought for 700,000 new builds that are rented for $2,500 a month. And they may have 10 properties, and that sounds great on paper, but those properties aren't cash flowing. So find out if the properties they have are cash flowing. That's where I talk about investment style. What kind of investor are they? Because 10 properties are not created equal. One person can have 10 properties that are cash flowing really well, and their net worth statement looks the same as another person with the identical net worth statement, but has 10 properties that don't cash flow that well because they bought properties that you know rent for bad rent to price ratios. So you gotta dig a little deeper and find out, you know, what kind of income are they bringing in? What kind of expenses do they have? What's their burn rate? And then what kind of wealth do they have? So I asked myself, how long would it take them to burn through all the money they have and then not be able to pay me? And if they have millions of dollars and their burn rate's very low, it's gonna take them like 50 or 100 years to burn through all the money they have, or one really, 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 or several really, really bad business decisions, which like, again, you're evaluating the person. Are they astute in business? Are they solid? Um, and if they are, then you say, okay, that's a check mark. I feel like this picture makes sense. The person's solid in business. It's likely they won't have a big business mistake. If they did, they've got the net worth and the liquidity to make sure that they can solve those, those issues. Someone's on the edge who has maybe 20,000. Imagine having a portfolio of like 50 properties and have like $10,000 in cash. Hopefully, they just have some lines of credits they can dip into in an emergency. That's at least an emergency line of credit that's there to keep them. It's cash. It's solvency at least. Um, but that's something to think about, right? When you go to liquidity, you say, okay, are they liquid? Do they have some cash that in the event of an emergency, based on their current portfolio or the project they're working on, could they dip into their personal reserves to finish the project? Say they borrowed $300,000 to do a flip with you and they were going to put up their own 50,000 renovations. What if the project takes 80,000 renovations? If they don't have $50,000 sitting around, their project might grind to a halt. And then you have carrying costs. And then all of a sudden they can't pay you back, can't make your interest payments. So you gotta think through what might happen, what could happen. And that's why as a borrower, I need to do a good job of articulating how like that. I just need to be comfortable saying, here's my bank account. This is why I'm not a liquidity risk. Here's my net worth statement. Here's my frugal living habits. Like, I know these are all things that like, I would look for, um, maybe jump in the comments. If I'm missing something you used to buy a, a borrower, let me know. Um, but I think social proof is good too. I like to know that if the person doesn't pay me back and they, I want them to know that I'm going to hang it over them. Like I'm going to comment on their Facebook, on their Instagram, on their YouTube channel, all over. Everyone's going to know that they owe me money and they haven't paid it back. And they, I would never do that to someone unless they actually like, Hey, I can't pay you back or something to that effect. And I mean, if they're working with me to pay me back, that's okay. They're making installments or trying at least, but somebody just like goes cold. And there's one example of that. Um, not going to share on social media right now, but I have one example of a contractor that I fronted some money to. And they still owe money to me. And I'm considering calling them out. And I know where they live and their family and all these things. And they think they could just declare bankruptcy and get out of this, but you know, you can't do that. That isn't how it works. You're going to go after me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've not had any lending go bad, but I've had one contracting thing like that where I should have done these 10 things. Even on a contractor, I've been like, hey, are they liquid? Are they, you know, will they be insolvent? What are their spending habits like? Um, so social proof is important, I think, because then you have a, a recourse, an action you can go after them. Like the, you know, if they're part of the Better Business Bureau, their business too is a nice way. You can get some comfort there. Referrals are important because they can call the referrals and say, hey, you let the money, they're not paying me back. What's going on? And then you can get dig deeper. And sometimes that social pressure, right? If their friends call and say, hey man, you gotta pay that guy back. What are you doing? Give me interest payments. That helps. It'll push them in gear to pay you back. So that's important too, I think. Social proof, online presence, referrals, um, family and uh, community. I think, how do you judge that? I'm not gonna say that single people are higher risk, but I prefer to lend to people with families. Um, or at least have a significant other, or at least have like family in the country. That makes me feel more comfortable than someone who's an international immigrant who just got here who has no one. That's, that's, I don't feel very comfortable lending against that. Even if they met all the other criteria, what if they just go back to their home country? I have no recourse. I can only sue them in the Canadian legal system. What am I going to do here, right? So I want somebody who's a citizen. I want someone who's ingrained, has good family connections here, lots of friends. You know, I, in an ideal world, they, you know, they're not going to leave that. Area. Their plan is to be here for a long time. 
So they're not going to be planning to do a ton of traveling or planning to move to another country in two years. That would be maybe a bit of a, a, bit of a risk because they might just decide to walk away with your money. That's something to think about. Um, do I? Okay. Um, good observation. If someone doesn't pay on a personal loan, would it affect the person who took the loan's credit? Um, I'm trying to understand that question. So someone doesn't pay a person a personal loan. So let's say someone borrowed money. They couldn't pay it. Would it affect the person who took the loan's credit? So if you borrow money, you don't pay it back, and then you file against them, there'll be a collections charge registered on the credit score. So if, imagine someone didn't pay. Like literally, if I borrow money from someone, imagine I borrow hundred grand from someone, which is like might seem like a lot of money to you guys, but hundred grand doesn't go very far to me. It's not a lot of money. But if I borrow hundred grand from someone, and I took that hundred grand and I didn't pay pay them back, which is hypothetical to answer your question, they would file against me. Show the agreement. They file small claims. It wouldn't even be small claims to the larger amount, but they would file a judgment against me. They would file collections against me. Say, say I didn't pay. If I didn't pay after the judgment was ordered, say, hey, you got to pay this money plus interest plus court costs, etc. Then you can register a lien against their assets. If they had no assets, um, then you just register and garnish wages. If they ever decide to work, then you get paid when they work. So there are recourses in Canada. You can sue someone and get the money back. Off, you can garnish their wages for forever until they're, until they're paid back. But uh, yeah, as soon as there's a judgment against you like that, it gets reported to the credit bureau. So their credit score would go from like, 800 to 500 quick. So if one of those pops up on your credit report and it's not legitimate, you need to fight that ASAP. It'll destroy your credit. No Aylander bank will lend you any money as soon as that happens. For me to never be able to borrow Aylander money again, like if I didn't repay someone, I didn't destroy my credit, I couldn't even. Um, that would, it would literally destroy my business and destroy my life. That's why paying people back is so important when you're dealing with someone who has a good track record and a good net worth and a good established everything. The reputation of the brand means a lot. Like my brand to me is worth like a million dollars. So for me to say, if one person, if I were to not pay someone back ever, and that were to get back to me, then that would be just a nightmare, right? Like that would be a situation where I would destroy my whole brand. It's just not worth it. Like I would actually rather go back to work than not pay someone back. Um, that's, I would rather not be fired. I'm taking calculator calculated risk here, right? So I don't feel like I'm taking those kinds of risks, which I'll probably not go back to work. But uh, at the end of the day, like if someone's got a good brand, like at least a million dollar brand, um, more, that provides a little bit of safety too, right? Now it's not in and of itself is not enough, but if you had all 10 of those factors and you're hammering out each one really well. And like, honestly, if someone came to me that was me, <laughs> this is funny. So literally looking through this, of all the people that I know right now, there's one other person like myself that I know that meets these sort of boxes. But other than that one other person, the two of us, if any of those people came to me and had all 10 of those boxes checked and had a good plan of what they want to do with my money, in like three years time from now, when I've got like 10 million bucks, and they said, hey, I want to take a million bucks of your money and go invest it, I would love that. If that person exists, reach out to me. Um, if you exist, reach out to me because I would fund you. I would back you. I don't find a lot of these people that meet all 10 of these metrics. I guess I'm a rare breed. Like to find all 10 of these things, to find some, most of the people who are, who meet all these boxes, they have institutional money. They don't need private loans or they're just hard to find. Like this person that meets all 10 of those boxes and is like a really low risk and offering a decent return, that's hard to find. Oftentimes there's something that you're missing. It's usually a risk or something associated with that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tricky one um, at the end of the day. I'm gonna try to hit more some questions now. I think I've covered everything as far as the 10 questions, but we're gonna dive deeper into that in a sec after I answer some questions. So, jeez, I gotta go lightning round. This took long, this is actually longer than I thought. Did the Facebook actually end up streaming still? Is this still on Facebook? Yes, it's still on. That's cool. I don't know if the replay will work, but your engagement is better on this week, I think. Yeah, fair enough. Um, oh, I think my mother was watching it. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, so you asked about credit cards. We answered that question. That was where we left off, I think. And I'm reading from the chat that's merged YouTube and Facebook, and I don't see any Facebook, so I don't think Facebook linked up. 
properly, but we'll see. I'll check the recordings out. And see. Okay, it's up, but I don't see the comments. So, if there's any comments on there on Facebook, cool. Um, I'll try to get them after. My favorite young millennial millionaire pouring out his heart. Keep them coming, Mike. God bless. Hey, thank you. I appreciate that so much. That, that means a lot. Okay, I noticed you got a new work truck. So, you like a drywall now? Um, <laughs> okay, no. So, the work truck is not. I'm coming. The work truck, it's almost my daughter's back home, so I gotta wrap it up. But it's almost, uh, the reason that the work truck is for the company, I don't even drive it. I haven't even driven it yet. I've sat in it, turned it on. <laughs> um, I got a really sweet deal, it's F 150 with eight foot extended cab and topper with its suicide doors. Sweet vehicle, can tow our six by 12 enclosed trailer. But my head general contractor, he's sharing it with the other uh, general contractor that works on our team full time. Uh, those guys are sharing the work truck. So the truck is for them. Um, they had a, a truck breakdown, so it, it just made sense for us to bonus them effectively with a vehicle. Um, so yeah, we have now in our uh, construction side, we do have a F-150 picked up for a sick deal. Got it for $3,700. And it's got like 200K, it's 2009. That's a good deal for an F-150 2009 with a topper on the back, it's worth like $1,000. Now we had to put 1500 bucks of work into it. Um, the tra transmission line, the brakes, and a few other things we had to do to it. But now it's all fixed up, good condition, safety, and all good to go. That's going to be great for basically servicing a lot of our maintenance renovations and stuff like that as well. So it's going to be great to have that extra vehicle. Some of our contractors already have vehicles, like one of our contractors already has a truck, but having another one is nice. And uh, so we were happy to do that. It's kind of cool, it makes us feel official. Never lend to family and friends. Future Wars is a great point. Um, Lending to family can be very, I like to lend to friends, but lending to family can be very difficult. I lend to family and uh, I didn't have a good personal experience with it. It's very hard to collect the money. Even on the default, if it's like your mom or your grandma or your aunt, it's hard to collect. Coming to Christmas and it's awkward because you know they owe you money and they're not paying. And so like, just be careful. Even if you're lending for real estate, be careful. I did that and uh, I didn't follow those 10 things. If I had pulled credit score, I would have saw they had a credit score of like 590. And I know that now, but I didn't know that then. Um, certain things like that, like net worth, that they didn't want to provide any of that. They didn't know how to do any of that, that calculation. So I didn't do any due diligence. I lent because I had a relationship. And relationship alone isn't enough. I think with friends, it might be because you, you can see professionally how they've been doing. And it's a bit of a challenge for playing with friends as well. Because um, again, what happens if they don't want to pay you? It's risky. I think if you're dealing with someone who's very wealthy, it's a little bit different situation, like in the amount you're lending to, right? So 100 grand to someone who's just starting out is a lot of money. 100 grand to me is nothing. Like it's literally around me, man. I didn't, if I lost $100,000 out of my net worth, I'd be like, oh, well. Like, that doesn't even affect me, right? Really. In the grand scheme of things, I'd still be fired and have no effect at all. Even like 300 grand, it's not even a lot of money to me. I could lose that and it'd be just fine. So it depends on the, on the relative to the person's net worth. So when you're doing the whole 10 questions, like if you lending them, say, $500,000 and the net worth's like $700,000, you're lending them almost their entire net worth. If things go bad, that's a big thing for them. Even if you're a rich investor who's going to be lending this money out, the borrower is borrowing more than they can probably handle or paying you back. Right? So it's relative to what they have, relative to what they've been dealing with, that sort of thing. Like it's all relative. Uh, hey Mike, you ever going to break into commercial apartments? Robert Morrissey, you want to have your contract right now? A seven box in downtown London. Um, it's got like 19 bedrooms and a commercial unit in it that's a restaurant. So there you go. Mixed use commercial, getting into it. Um, has potential to be a great little like Airbnb play too because so many bedrooms right downtown. Um, I was thinking about signing it, but I think I'm just going to take it down. It's going to be a really fun deal. Um, so yeah, the Getting into some commercial stuff. You guys know that it's very hard to do commercial anything in real estate because you're competing against dumb institutional money. They won't fight with you in the residential space, the duplex, triplex. So that's sort of the, the challenge, I think, um, breaking into commercial is it's hard. This property is, is a fantastic one. It's a 10 cap, 11 cap, almost 12 cap potential. And it just was not marketed well. It's very rare that the large, large multifamily isn't marketed well. When you're dealing with that high amount of money, those big buildings, they're often marketed very well. At the end of the day, it comes out of rent roll. Last week on the Wise Wall Show, or sorry, the Mike Rosehart Show, I talked about multifamily investing. I'm going to take that video from there. I'm going to put it on the main channel, I think, at some point. 
But this time, I got to keep the wave going. I want to get to 25,000 subscribers in the next 60 days on the main channel. That means I need to nail really good content. I think the best content is going to be like financial independence and more generic real estate investing topics like kind of like buyer's rent and basic stuff like that. Uh, but we'll get into it. We go deep on the other channel, right? And on socials. Hey, Mike, want to buy in Hamilton? Think it could cash flow with the best way to build a network of wholesalers to find a good private deal. Uh, yeah, so private deals, definitely tough. Go to networking events, social media, go on Kijiji, et cetera. Build those relationships. That's how to do it. Is literally go out there and, and talk to people. That's the best way. Hey, Mike, what real estate meetups and conferences do you typically go to? I recently went to my first one. I'm going to start going to more and I want to meet you. So Daniel, thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, I go to the London on Fire meetup here in, in London. I go to the London Real Estate uh, Investors Association as well. Um, I occasionally will frequent a couple other ones. I'm due to go check out the, the Right Club. Uh, there's a couple other ones I want to go check out. I need to start networking. Admittedly, I'm too busy. I need to start going to networking events or maybe just throw in like a mastermind for free, like a free mastermind, just to like, it's just in the spirit of frugality. I think we should just get together and have some fun for just the cost of, like whatever it would cost to fly there and to stay there. So I'm thinking of planning, I mentioned this on social media, for those people who follow me on Instagram, um, at my gross art that I'm planning on doing some sort of retreat. I don't know if it'll be in Florida or Costa Rica, but we'll rent something there. We'll just split the cost. So it'll be no profit. Just all this going down to to basically carry the cost of the event and have some fun together. So that might be something I'm thinking about doing, but I'm not really interested in doing an events company or doing like all that kind of stuff. I just don't have an interest in that. Uh, Mike, this is no restaurant. The challenge is killing me. I'm worried that I'll fall off the wagon. Well, you can do it. Hold in there. Stay true to that 30 day challenge. I believe in you. Uh, okay. Emma says hi. Hey, Mike, how is Limitless going? Limitless is going well. Uh, last I checked, the electrician came in and fixed the last of the stuff. We have the clears in there, they'll clean everything up. And I believe we're in the process, it might be rented. We're either in the process of renting it or it might be rented. It's tough because it's a student property and we missed the boat with all those electrical problems we have. We couldn't get it rented for May 1. The renovation didn't finish till after May. Fortunately, when you're doing student rental properties and they don't finish on the bandwagon, you're like, your good catch time is like May 1 and September 1 for sometimes a little bit in January 1, but for the most part, May 1 and September 1. So we might be stuck with September 1. Um, we have a hard decision of whether we just sell and take a profit. Like we could literally hold it for the summer. We could put people in and then we not be on the student cycle and get less rent and put a family in. Um, not as ideal because I mean, it's a great location for students. But uh, yeah, we could just literally sell the property and take like 40, 50 grand profit and be done with it, like treat it like a flip. There are lots of options out there. So we should have an offline conversation about that. But good question. Would you deal with people who want to get into the duplex, triplex? Yeah, um, sure, definitely. I, I do a lot of stuff with a lot of JVs with people who want single family duplex, triplex. I do a lot of that myself. Um, so you won't be doing any more GVs just doing private money. No, no, Brandon, um, definitely not. We are still going to be doing joint ventures. We are still doing the partnering that we're doing. I would just like to build my own personal portfolio up again, five or 10 properties. Uh, I have no interest in doing just private lending. That's, that's too much. I like still doing the joint venture partnerships. I like where, what we're doing there. I'm just saying the diversity is nice. It's nice to have some properties where I'm not accountable to update everyone all the time, right? I just an account and the rent goes in and I manage it and I don't have to update anyone. Which is really really nice. Um, there's a lot of investor relations stuff. Stay tuned though. We have some really big stuff in the pipeline for how we're gonna. I can't even talk about it yet. But our investors on the joint venture side are gonna be really happy with how we change the platform um, of communicating everything. There's gonna be a portal, and it's gonna be really streamlined software. So that's still coming soon. It's gonna simplify our life in a big way. Uh, okay. These information says I was a wash. I had a washing license and bonded washing repair company because washing machines to leak upstairs and leak to the downstairs ceiling. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah, it does happen. Um, sure, that's a great return. The two seem to be complementary businesses. Brandon says thirty six point nine nine percent is the highest in Canada. There you go. So that's the highest interest rate you can charge before it's criminal. Um, okay, what are the downsides to financing via FHA loans? I don't have a ton of experience financing with FHA loans. Um, if it requires private mortgage insurance, it's going to have an additional cost. That would be a downside. 
something to think about. Um, Jeremy jumps on the dumb, the bad, and the failures. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, I see that. I just pop on that. That's cool. Um, yeah, there you go. The dumb, the bad, and the failures. Yeah. Thoughts on getting a commercial mortgage? Um, yeah, it, definitely something that you can do. You have to pay a higher interest rate. I think you pay 4% typically for a commercial type of uh, type of product, but it is what it is. Uh, found a place, but it's seven units. Apparently, you put 25% down. Yeah, so credit unions will still be 20% down, often on commercial stuff, if you push. They'll start with saying 30 or 35 down, and only 65% will be value because maybe it's mixed commercial. Or is it just, it's just seven units residential. Desjardins is your guy to go to. Desjardins has seven units residential mortgages. RBC does up to six units. All the big four, like TD, Scotia, and BMO, all do up to four units residentially. So you can finance a sixplex the same as a duplex with RBC, but a sevenplex with Desjardins. So hit up Desjardins so you can buy residential properties, residential mortgages on commercial, not commercial properties, but sevenplexes that are all residential. Uh, okay. Andrew says, I just joined recently, guessing you're discussing how to select who to lend to. Yeah, so we're just talking about private lending, private lending 101. This is an episode literally on private lending. The whole video is about private lending, except for the Q&A at the end. Um, bathroom style audio. I don't know what that means. Maybe it's like, uh, it's out of my shirt, potentially. I don't know. Uh, don't know. Okay, so these information says, yeah. Okay, and Andrew says, you need to have some experience and your own money before others will trust you with their money. Yeah, it's a very true saying. Um, you should be starting a family with close friends if you don't have those two. Check. I check most of those off. My net worth is still a bit low. Yeah, so I guess, Andrew, it's kind of, it's, it's tricky, right? Um, I like someone who's proven, like he's done a lot of deals. But not just a lot of deals, a lot of successful deals. So someone who's done 20 deals successfully, they're probably rich. If their net worth isn't really high, they've not really done 20 successful deals. Or they have a spending problem, in which case that's another red flag. So the first question is, are they rich? If I'm going to lend someone, are they rich? Do they have something to lose? Um, are they trustworthy? Flight risk, like all those things. That that's basically what I'm trying to get at. All those same questions with the ten questions on credit score, traffic, the net worth, spending habits, lifestyle, liquidity, social proof, referrals, something to lose, online presence, uh, flight risk, referrals, family, community, and investment style. Those are the boxes you need to be checking and going greater depth, of course, on each of those boxes. But if you do that, small checklist. I can do that in typically like three hours looking at a person. That's three hours is going to save you a lot of time, a lot of headache, and oftentimes. You could still borrow from family and friends, but oftentimes family and friends won't check those boxes, right? So just be careful when you're lending to family and friends. Um, of course, borrowing from family and friends is the easiest because you have the relationship. So it's, if you had rich parents or something, wish I did. Wish I could call my mom and dad and say, hey, can I borrow 100 grand? That would be great at the beginning. If you can do that, do that. If you have that connection, that's amazing. I'll use that because your parents are going to believe in you no matter what. They're going to know your whole story. You don't have to go through all this hassle. <laughs> I haven't even had a chance to look at the numbers. Um, I don't know. The numbers didn't look good when I walked through it. The ARV after pros and cons, it was very tight. Not a lot of profit. Um, I'm leading to know, but maybe I can't say no for sure. So thanks for asking, Ryan. Uh, I'll touch base with you after once I do bath time. And my whole day gets destroyed by all the things I have to do on my phone. And things like that. So, uh, Andrew says live. Roxanne says, Mike Loki signed himself like a beast. Uh, yeah, I guess not intentionally, but I did make the ask halfway through. Like, if people, I actually do have a couple of deals right now that I would like to find at a fourplex in London, Ontario, $190,000. That is extremely cheap. Go on MLS, go on Realtor.ca right now and find me four one bedroom units, a fourplex, five minutes south of downtown for under $300,000 right now. I challenge you. That's how far below the market this is. It should be like raising money. It should be like that. Like it should just, money should just pour in, right? Um, you're live. No breaks. Okay, cool. That's right. He is signing himself. That's correct, Andrew. 
I am looking for $190,000. And I want to educate people, right? So I didn't just go on here and say, hey, I'm looking for money. I made it educational. And I thought, hey, you know what? It makes sense to talk about private lending. Because, hey, when I get to the point where I have enough money that I want to retire, I don't want to be doing the, op the operating exchange, you know, tenant problems, renovations, all the problems are associated with running an active portfolio. I just want to set it and forget. I want that mailbox money in the first of the month. It's easy. I don't have to worry about anything. So for me, that's where I'm involving too. So even someone who's an expert in the field will eventually want to lend money out. And so it makes a lot of sense, I think, to think about how, how to do that. I'm probably going to take this video and take some of these clips and use them for social media because people don't know how to do this. So people I talk to just lend to like their friend Joe because they trust them and they get burned, right? Or their family, like freaking Tammy or something, just making our names here, no relation. But because they don't follow these things. And so someone asked me yesterday and said, hey, I made a post on Instagram. I said, hey, I'm looking for $180,000 for a property. Now, I actually have $190,000 in cash. I have way more than that in cash right now. I can't touch it because I have to keep it uh, set aside for qualifying. I even have lines of credits, unsecured, that I can use to buy this property. Um, I have investments I can use. I can't touch anything because I want to get a valued property for this business that's closing. And I was curious like how hard it would be to raise money like that. Turns out it's not that hard, but it was interesting because people asked, and I think I already have it funded, but I could always take more money because I'll just buy another deal. But I hear you and I'm coming. She's got to bang on the door. Wait for it. There it is. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? Lost my train of thought. Oh, it's my daughter banging. I'm coming, Emma. Um, I forgot my line of train. Oh, someone asked, how do you determine whether or not to lend to someone? And I thought about that and I was like, wow, you know what? People don't know how the process to determine whether or not how to lend someone. And so when I say I'm a, a really safe investment, people don't know what that means. Like anyone can say, hey, I'm a safe person to borrow money from. What criteria are you using to decide that? Like how do I show that objectively I'm a safe investment? And so I thought about every single possible criteria and maybe I'm missing something, jump in the comments. If, I, if I'm missing something that you would use to determine whether you would lend to someone, of course, I didn't break down project type, but when you're looking at reviewing your project, you of course need to have things like lease agreements on that specific project. Ideally, you'd like to see like tenant acknowledgements and probably an appraisal report would be really important. But again, the borrower side and the project side. Uh, okay, uh, step 11, invest with micro tenant. Yeah, I mean, that's an option. You don't have to invest with me. Like, there's lots of way to go around. If you take anything from this video, say, hey, now I know how to decide how to put together a good business case to borrow money or how to determine who to lend to. So that's what this video is hoping to accomplish. I think it's done that. Uh, I wish I had my, to have a problem to decide who to lend to. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a rich man's problem to have, but a lot of people in Canada have that, especially in Toronto, Vancouver, et cetera. Um, that's a cheap brand. I was like a million dollars, I was say. I just throw it out there. I wasn't actually trying to buy it. Um, my word, my bond is probably worth hundred million dollars. So over my whole lifetime, those are probably my possible learnings. Please post the list in the description. I'll work on a few. I might be missing. Uh, okay, definitely do that. Uh, this mortgage fund begins to increase after refinancing, which is working. Cash flow. Yeah, so exactly. That's true. You refinance, you'll have higher mortgage payments. Congrats on the apartment. Oh, on the seven unit. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, we usually go up, refinance, and hire a person. Yeah, that's correct. That's the question. Seven units is still small, very true. Um, Mike, the is asking for some internet. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, like, great work. If you ever plan to scale up to like Ben Mala? <laughs> yeah, I do like to watch Ben Mala's uh, on the concrete channel, Life for Sale, Michelle. Great, great show. Uh, 200, 200 units at a time. Maybe, eventually. Uh, Planning the same thing, like to grow a certain network. Land and set up here myself. It's all work. Definitely is, 100%. All great questions. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I really gotta go, my daughter's like freaking out down here. So, time for bath time, bedtime. And I'll see you guys back on social media. If you have any comments, make sure it's all posted to Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Private lending 101 how do you determine who to lend to, and how do you determine how to borrow money and value risk to reward? So, I think it was quite robust. Hopefully, you got some value. If you did, jump in the comments, let me know what you got some value from. Thank you all.
All right. Good night, everyone. Spend less, earn more, maximize your returns, and I'll see you this Saturday. Smash the like button on the video. Stop and start your daily job. Bye-bye.